Brother Barnes, it's all yours. Yes, I'm a robber of churches. Amen. My brother Cobb said I could have them. That's my story anyways. <clears throat> I don't know. It feels like a two-joke night, so let's just do that. This is a blonde, blonde woman joke. If you're offended, I don't care. <laughs> I've raised daughters that are blonde right down to the roots. So just... One day a supervisor walks by the cubicle of a blonde woman and notices her crying. What seems to be the problem? Can I help with something? The boss asked tenderly. The blonde replied, choking back tears, I will be okay. I just got a phone call telling me my mother passed away. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that, said the boss. Why don't you go home for the day, take as much time as you need? The blonde said, no, I'm better off here. Work will take my mind off things. The boss, well, okay, but if you change your mind, feel free to leave. Twenty minutes later, her boss again is walking by her cubicle and sees that she is just crying uncontrollably. Oh my, are you going to be all right? The blonde said, I just got off the phone with my sister, and she said her mother passed away too. <laughs> They don't get better as they go along. I start out at the zenith and kind of. <clears throat> I went to Walmart today and I was only in there for a short time, but when I came out, there was a police officer writing a parking ticket for being in a handicapped spot without a handicap notice. So I went up to him and said, come on, how about giving a guy a break? He ignored me and continued writing the ticket. So I called him a pencil neck cop. He glared at me and started writing another ticket for unsafe tires. So then I asked him if his psychiatrist makes him lie face down on the couch because he's so ugly. <laughs> he finished the second ticket, put it on the windshield with the first and with a bit of a swagger. Then he started writing a third ticket. This went on back and forth until he had placed five tickets on the windshield. The more I insulted him, the more tickets he wrote. I really didn't care though. My car was parked in the next row over. <laughs> Amen. I, I don't think there's anything wrong with laughing in church, is there? <clears throat> A merry heart doeth good like a medicine. Amen. You know, I'm reminded that whenever I come in, <clears throat> that God has two books. He has an outdoor book. He has an indoor book. The outdoor book is nature itself. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament sheweth his handiwork. Day unto day other speech, and night unto night sheweth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the son, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoices as a strong man to run a race, whose going forth is from the end of the heavens and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoice in the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are right, rejoice in the heart. You know, when we go outside, God is always speaking to us in the outside book. 
I praise the Creator who made this world so fair. As I scan the realm of nature, I can see his image there. In the steep and on the hilltop, there I see his royal throne. And the God that made the mountain ever loves me as his own. So that's the outdoor book. God's constantly speaking to us. So let me invite you to take his indoor book. Let's go to Luke chapter 9 this evening. Let me preach for an hour and a half in 45 minutes. You folks are so blessed. I'm going to be back here Sunday. Yeah, just, that, that just gives you fair warning. Any excuse is a good excuse. Amen. I just can't make it Sunday. I understand. I understand. Luke chapter number 9, verse number 51. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem and sent messengers before his face. And they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. I want to ask you a question tonight. What spirit do you have? What spirit do you have? Verse 55, Jesus is rebuking them. You know not what manner of spirit you are of. Let me ask you, what, what spirit do you have? Let's have a word of prayer. We'll get started tonight. Gracious Lord, we love you. I don't believe, I don't believe people leave their home and travel some distance to be here in the house of the Lord on Wednesday night if there's not at least some expression of love for eternal things and our eternal God. And so, Father, I pray that you would bless us tonight with your very presence. And, Father, that you would feed us from your word and that as willing sheep we would take it, we would digest it, we would make it part of us. Lord, strengthen us tonight by thy spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Nothing proves more that we still have a fallen nature, even after salvation, than those times when we say something trying to sound spiritual, but immediately the Holy Spirit rebukes us and we are ashamed once again. And may I remind you, we're not alone in this. Paul described his own internal conflicts with his carnal flesh in Romans chapter 7. There we find that his heart delighted in the law of God, but his members, that's his body, and your members include your tongue, (laughs) brought him into captivity to the law of sin. His conclusion was in his epitaph, O wretched man that I am. You know, if we've not similarly felt that same way at the end of the day sometimes, I doubt if we have grown much in the Lord. You know, Peter is not the only one with a foot-shaped mouth. Amen. There's been more times that I've eaten humble pie than I care to rehearse. I have never developed a flavor or a taste for it. But there are times that I have spoken hastily or without forethought. And immediately the Spirit of God says, that wasn't right. And because I'm a man, I didn't retract it. (laughs) I just let it lay. And of course that just festers. And sometimes our false bravado gets in the way of us actually becoming more spiritual. I think James and John immediately felt remorse when Jesus turned and spoke to those words to them. 
It was a learning experience for them for sure. And I hope for us as well this evening. If you were to review <clears throat> this past week, this is Wednesday night, let's go to a week ago, Wednesday. And if you were to review the moments in between in light of what Jesus was saying to James and John, and we posed it to us tonight, what manner of spirit are ye of? And you judged yourself, what would you say about your words and your actions at work? You say, I'm retired, so I dodged that bullet. Okay. What about your conversation with your spouse? What spirit were you of when you said those things? What about what you said about your parents, young person? What about what you said about your adult children, older persons? What have you said about lost sinners that need a gospel witness? But we, and I, I'm guilty of this as much as anybody, they're all tatted to, tattoo, tatted up. They got more stuff hanging on them than a hardware store. They dress inappropriately, can we say. Guys are wearing a man bun. That just makes me feel queasy all over. But what is our response? And sometimes I'm there and I'm passing mentally, at least a judgment. I may not say anything because they're bigger than I am. But mentally, I am passing judgment on them. And then when I get back in the truck and I hit the ignition key, the Spirit of God reminds me, maybe not in these words, but reminds me, what spirit are you of? What spirit do others sense about us when they attend New Life Baptist Church? Or Tremont Baptist Church? Or Second Baptist Church? And I think that's it for good churches in Maine. <laughs> but it's just, what, what, what do they sense when they walk into our service? How, how are they received? Uh, are they welcome or are they held at arm's length? Because maybe there's just something about their persona that just kind of sets you against them. What manner of spirit does Brother Cobb have towards this church? I think it's a fair question. But conversely, what spirit, what manner of spirit does this church have towards Brother Cobb and his wife? What were the comments after Sunday's messages? Well, I said it wasn't about Brother Cobb, it was Brother McVeigh. All right, well, that's fair game. But if it was Brother Cobb, what about last Wednesday's message? I'm just throwing these out as fodder to get us to think. What manner of spirit are you? And let me just put this out there. I, I've said it to one man here. I think Brother Cobb is probably the only pastor I know that could pull off in tandem with this church the camp meeting that you do every year. That's such an electric mix of oddballs. I would strangle half of them. It's just, you know, I just come for the entertainment. To see Brother Ken run up and down the aisles with his hands waving because he's had too many energy drinks. You know, I just... <laughs> but I don't know anybody else that could pull that off. Congratulations to you, Brother Cobb. I know it's in tandem, so... But that's just, that's just my take on it. But James and John here said that they displayed a manner of spirit. The word manner there has the idea that there are certain qualities to it. There's certain characteristics of it. It's, sometimes we talk about a genre of movies. Me, I, I enjoy the genre called Western movies. There's three things that make them good. Horses, cowboys, and horses. All right. <laughs> Now, each one is different, but each one travels in the same plot, same storyline. 
the manner of spirit was just being manifested and what they were saying and how they were condemning this. But this wasn't an isolated case. James and John, the sons of thunders, I mean, they was ready to kill everybody that dis disagreed with them. And, and if I'm not careful, I feel the same way sometimes. And somehow I feel justified in that. But Jesus was visiting a village of the Samaritans, and he was returning to Jerusalem. The Samaritans and the Jews did not get along. And when they knew Jesus was set to go to Jerusalem, the Samaritans would not receive him, which caused James and John to speak about retaliation. Verse 54, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias did? Why would the Lord need them to call down fire? Is that too much for, for, for Jesus to do? So they're, they're assuming something that doesn't need to be assumed. Jesus rebuked in verse 55. He was more concerned about their harsh and critical attitude than he was the poor reception by the Samaritans. Guilty. Guilty. Sometimes I am quick, very quick, caustic to the point, at least thinking. I may not verbalize it. I've learned a little bit. <laughs> Pick your battles, amen. <laughs> but at least in my mind, I'm thinking, what a screwball. This guy's in left field. And when I think that, believe me, he is in left field. But I don't need to be condemnatory in saying that. And I don't have to think, boy, I'm just waiting for a bolt of lightning to take this guy out, you know. If God was in the lightning business of executing people, I don't think any of us would stand a very fair chance. But does this remind you of anybody? Personally, maybe the person in the mirror. When Jesus was mistreated, they took it personally. Their words of condemnation was also an expression of their loyalty to Jesus. Their allegiance was right, but their spirit was wrong. They had the right position, but the wrong disposition. We should all have a right, strong position, but we should have the right disposition that goes along with it, i.e. charity, grace, Brotherly kindness, you know, just, we don't have to be right on everything. There's enough of us that are. We don't need a whole gang of people. We should work at having a good disposition. And for some of us, it's more work than others. You know, my wife, God bless her, you know, I'll see something and I'll get a little angst about it. She'll say, Settle down. I hate that. <laughs> Don't tell me to settle down. I'm a bulldog on the end of a leash. You know, there's, some, there's something not right there. I'm, I'm, I'm charging going ahead here. You know, this is, we're talking doctrine here, lady. <laughs> this, take, it, take it easy. Driving down the road. You know, there's 7 billion people in the world and I'm the best driver. That's, that's confirmed. I mean, it's just, you're driving down the road, and there's a guy with his little hybrid, putt, putt. And for some, for the life of me, they can't do the speed limit. I don't know if the motor quits, if they go over one mile or what it is. But, and here I am, I'm driving my truck, you know, the speed limit says 55. That means you can do 65. This is Maine, amen. I got business, I've got places to go, people to see, things to do. And then they have the New York license plate on there. I mean, that just gets your blood pressure. I'm already on blood pressure medication. I've just got to up it even more when I get home. You just take the bottle and just. And my wife says, honey, you, you don't have to be in such a hurry. You don't have to pass them on the right. <laughs> and I feel like I have some familiar friends in that category here tonight. Which just goes to show we have a little bit of work to do, don't we? 
Go to Matthew chapter number 7, if you would. I think I only have several places to go. What manner of spirit are you? You know, the Bible several times tells us to examine ourselves. Sometimes it's to examine ourselves in relationship to salvation. Are we truly saved? Are we bearing the fruits of that, the fruits of repentance? If you're not saved, you'll never bear the fruits of repentance, at least long term. You may be a will-o'-the-wisp. You may reform for a little while, but then you'll be off doing the same wickedness that you was before. You need to get saved, amen. But we also need to examine ourselves, make sure that we're walking with the Lord the way we should be walking with the Lord. And one of those is checking our spirit. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 2, For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged, and with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Rot roll. Now the Bible's not against judging. This whole chapter has to deal with judging. You read the context here, it's all about judging. And the Bible further says we're going to judge angels. The Bible is not against judging. It's against, first of all, judging hypocritically. But there's something also in the nuance here of this, of this verse, verse number two. Be careful about judging others more harshly than you judge yourself. You know, you can condemn somebody for doing something and you've got a moat in your eye, bucko. That's Greek for you. (laughs) Now, we don't call it that. We call it something else where you don't understand the circumstances, the background, et cetera, et cetera. And we can be very dismissive about our sins while being very condemnatory of somebody else's sin. What manner of spirit are you? Go to Proverbs chapter 20. Proverbs chapter number 20, a couple verses there. <clears throat> Just to kind of flesh this out a little bit. Proverbs chapter 20, verse number 10. <coughs> That's not COVID. That's just preacher's throat. But in Proverbs chapter 20, verse number 10, it says, Divers weights and divers measures, both of them are an alike abomination to the Lord. Verse number 23 Divers' weights are an abomination unto the Lord, and a false balance is not good. He's against using different weights or means of measuring, especially when buying or selling, primarily in this context. Example, you use one weight for buying, so you get more goods for less money, but you slip in on the sly, sleight of hand, a different weight, when it comes to selling, there where you make more profit on your product. And God says that's an abomination. We want to be careful that we're measuring things equally towards others as we are for ourselves. If we compare ourselves among ourselves, there's a real fault. I've not walked in your shoes. You've not walked in my shoes. I've not traveled the road that you have traveled. And some of you, it's been a pretty rough road. I can see that. It wasn't paved anywhere, okay? (laughs) You have not traveled the road I have traveled. So we've got to be careful about comparing ourselves among ourselves because the Bible says to do that is unwise. So before we do that, we need to check what manner of spirit we are of. Are we a James, a John, or is Jesus saying, look, I appreciate the loyalty, I appreciate the the allegiance, I appreciate a strong position for those that would bring harm to the cause of Christ, but wait a minute, you got to have the right disposition to go with your position. It's just not all your way or the highway. Now, I think it should be. But it's not that way. Some, we need to be charitable. We need to be kind. We need to have brotherly kindness one towards another, especially within a church living in 2022 underneath all the cloud of stupidity that is at nosebleed height in the United States. If we're not careful, we'll be so busy picking at everything else that's going on outside these four walls, we won't be able to stop when we come inside the four walls. 
pick, 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 pick. There's no shutoff switch. And we come in and we just, it, it, it's the same. What manner of spirit are you? <clears throat> go to 1 Corinthians chapter 8. I think it's the last place I go. And unless I don't think you're really enjoying it, then I'll continue on. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. <clears throat> you know, verses 1 and 2 says, Now as touching things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. And if any man think that he knoweth anything, he knoweth nothing yet, as he ought to know. That's the emphasis. You know, we just can read it blandly. We can just read it at normal reading speed. We're going to miss some things. But if we emphasize each individual word, we don't have time for it this evening. But if we read that in such a way, if any man think that he knoweth anything, and I'm not trying to be smug here, he knoweth nothing yet as he ought to know. Can we admit that we don't know everything? I'm talking about you guys. I mean, it's, you know, <laughs> can we admit, even though we have knowledge, we don't have it to the degree that it will be available when we get to heaven? We see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. You know, I have spent a lifetime studying theology. There's probably not a systematic theology book out there that I have not read from kiver to kiver. I, I love doctrine. I teach doctrine. I preach doctrine. I, I think that's a good word. Some Baptist churches want to kick it to the corner. I think doctrine is a good word. But I still don't know everything like I would like to know. Knowledge puffeth up. Look at me. I got degrees and pedigree. Well, whoop de do. <laughs> if your doctrine isn't right, what difference does it make? You know those TV evangelists that preach the health and wealth stuff? You don't think they have a college degree? You don't think they have some measure of success as the world measures success? Knowledge puffeth up. But they don't know everything like they should know it, I'll guarantee you that. The Joel Olsteins of this world, the Kenneth Copelands of this world, you turn on the TV, just pick one. Well, aren't we supposed to grow in knowledge? Yes, we are. Second Peter says, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You see, your grace needs to keep up with your knowledge. Well, I just need to know more. <laughs> You may need a little bit more on the grace side. John says that grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Grace always, those two things are always in tandem together, grace and truth. It's wonderful to have truth. You know the atonement, you know the propitiation, you know the deity of Jesus Christ, you know baptism by immersion, you know the virgin birth, you know the reason why we hold the King James Bible, and on and on and on and on ad infinitum. But do you have the grace to where somebody might be attracted enough to actually give you a hearing? Or are you so overbearing that you just push people away? See, now with me, you get the both, best of both worlds. I mean, it's just, just the balance is right there. I mean, you could use me to level buildings. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't be running around doing it, I'll tell you that. I just, you know. Energy drinks, you know, just, that's all I can think of. I just, I was there for that Thursday night and just like, wow, somebody's got to dial him back a little bit and just, you know, just. Did God call, kill people in the Old Testament? Sure he did. Are we called to kill people that disagree with us? No. As the Bible says, vengeance belongeth to the Lord. It doesn't belong to us. The Bible says <clears throat> that now all these things happen unto them for in samples. 
and they are written for our admonition. Not examples and samples. That's why you need a King James Bible, by the way. The words are not misprints. They're there for a reason. And sample does not mean example. Example does not mean in sample. In sample always identifies the character qualities of the individual. An example could be a pattern of anything. You know, we have trucks. Four-wheel drive is an example of a vehicle that can go off-road. Okay. But it doesn't tell you what the ensample is of the driver behind the wheel. He's a nut job. It's just... So the Bible says in samples, these are written. Those people that were killed by serpents, they were bit by snakes. They were in a sample. In other words, their character qualities of defying God and defying his laws brought a premature death. But who was killing them? God was. Doesn't he know the heart? I don't think there's too many people around here that have got that x-ray vision where you can look inside and see somebody's heart. We're fruit inspectors. I can judge their fruit, amen. Let me see what you've been doing for the last six months. I can tell you where you stand with the Lord, and I'll be pretty close. If I'm not spot on, I'm telling you, I'm within one minute of angle here. I mean, I'm just close. I can judge fruit, but I can't see your heart. Let's be careful about what manner of spirit are you before we go out and we, we just want to condemn everything. Everybody. Just nuke them. <laughs> and let's start all over again. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I, I can feel that way sometimes. I have a bit of a bunker mentality. You know, I want to go up in Piscataquis County somewhere and have 5,000 acres and a gate at the end and, and landmines and claymores and drones that drop bombs and just leave me alone is the name of the road. And my, I'm, I'm back there somewhere, but I'm not telling you where. You come by invitation only. I have a backhoe and I can bury the bodies. Nobody will find them. I just, you know. But that's not what we're called to do. We're called to be a witness. And a lot of that witnessing involves people that just don't want to hear. And some of them can be very callous. And yet we cannot just turn around and say, God, will you kill them. God, they don't deserve to live. Well, neither do we. He says, look, boys, I didn't come here to condemn. I came here to save. And somehow we got to incorporate that and don't forget it and measure up to what manner of spirit are we. It should be the spirit of Christ. So that word of prayer tonight will be dismissed. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your word. Lord, personally, Father, I have fallen short. Too many times. And Father, I just pray for your help and your grace. And Lord, in a halting way, at least try to communicate a truth here tonight. That Father, we should strive to live. What manner of spirit are we? It's not just the world that's watching, it's you that's watching. And we want to bring honor and glory to the name of Christ. So, Lord, help us to strike that balance, that, that pendulum that swings. Both Help us to strike that balance to where we have grace and truth. We have loyalty and allegiance. We have the right position. But, Lord, may it be married to the right disposition as well. Would you help us? In Jesus' name, amen.